Haley, and I'm the Hope for HIA social worker. This is another installment of our peer perspective series. The next few peer perspective series will be focusing a little bit more on kind of outcomes, and they'll be with some of our families that have children in the older ages in our Hope for HIA community, so they can just share a little bit more about, you know, the wait and see and all of that, and then those later years. Um, again, this is just a peer perspective series, so this is not any kind of medical advice. It is just some wonderful, amazing parents sharing their story. So we hope that, you know, you can tune in and watch this and this will be on our YouTube channel. So I will let our panelists introduce themselves and then we will go ahead and get started and talk. So Megan, if you want to go ahead and go first. Um, I'm Megan. I live in Massachusetts. I have a 10 year old daughter um, that had a HIE injury at birth. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Margie, and I live in Virginia, and um, I have three kids. Um, one of them experienced HIE at birth. She's a twin, and um, they are 11 now. Great. Thank you both so much for sharing. Um, I'm excited for everyone to get to know both of you and your families. So if we could just start out with you sharing each of you a little bit about kind of your NICU journey and your NICU experience, and then a little bit about when you left the NICU, what that looked like for each of you. Do you want to go first, Margie? I can, sure. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, when our girls were born, um, it had been a normal identical twin pregnancy, um, which means that it was high risk. And so I was seeing the MFM and all this, but everything was, um, like nothing was wildly unusual. I had a little preterm labor. Um, and then I went into the MFM for a regular appointment and they were like, you're fine. Everything's fine. And I was like, something is terribly wrong. And they were like, go home. And then my water broke and everything in our world changed. Um, my daughters were born and the first, um, the first of them had an APGAR of one. And so uh, very quickly after they were, you know, they were both delivered, somebody brought us some paperwork and was like, we need to transfer this one to a higher level NICU. And so they transported her that night and she was in the NICU Let's see, it was five days before I got out of the hospital because all of us have like really traumatic, you know, most of us have really traumatic birth stories. Um, and by day 10 of life, um, we were told that she had to have, um, I should probably back up a little. When she got to the NICU, she was a multi-organ system failure. Like nobody knew what was wrong. All they knew was this was like the sickest baby, you know, that they had seen and they were, everybody was panicked. And we didn't even know that anything like this could happen. You know, it was just, it, it completely blew our minds. We were in an entirely different world. And, um, so the big concern at the beginning was that her she wasn't making urine, her kidneys weren't working. And then by day 10 of life, they said, we're going to have to start dialysis. We can't guarantee you that she will live until the surgery tomorrow. We can't guarantee you that she will live through the surgery tomorrow. And if she does, we can't guarantee you that it's going to work. And so that was the reality that we found ourselves in. So we've got one baby who's in this hospital who's relatively okay, you know, just a little bit early. We've got this one baby who is dying and um, they ended up doing the surgery. There were, you know, tons of procedures for her in the NICU between the dialysis and, you know, all of these scans and just uh, lines and, you know, all of these things. And she ended up being discharged from the NICU after 70 days. Um, and so, you know, just the NICU experience was like a living nightmare for us. And, you know, I think for lots of us who find ourselves just thrown in the situation, um, having had no idea that things like this even existed. Megan, do you want to share? Sure. Um, so um, 
my daughter was born August 7th, um, summer baby. Um, my pregnancy was fairly usual, um, minus a constant morning sickness throughout the, the whole nine months I did towards the end develop like mild preeclampsia. So I was induced at 37 and three. Um, and things were going okay until they weren't. <laughs> and the standard of care was violated. Um, and she went without oxygen, little to no oxygen for about 40 minutes, took 20 minutes to resuscitate her. Um, her APGARs were zero, zero, one. Um, and the NICU from a different state came to pick her up to start the cooling process. Um, she was, she was placed on a vent, but before the NICU even got there, she was, she was placed on a vent. Um, I was able to be transferred to be with her the very next morning, um, because she was, um, uh, ended up being a crash C-section. So the hospital she was at, let me do my post-op there. So that way I could be with her. Um, but everything was failing. She was an acute kidney failure. Um, her lungs kept collapsing. Uh, they did her, her first day MRI. They did one before we ended up being discharged. Um, she couldn't, um, suck, swallow, breathe. Um, came off of the vent. She wasn't drinking, obviously, the way she was supposed to. She was too much of an aspiration risk. She ended up getting um, a G-tube. Um, she did have seizures um, her first night of life, but they immediately put her on seizure meds, which she's she's been on since. Um, so the NICU was extremely traumatizing because I had never heard of HIE. And at the time, even Googling, I was, it was, there, there wasn't the kind of information there is now. Um, and it's not something you're ever prepared for in baby books or by doctors. Um, so we were discharged after 48 days um, with a ton of specialists, um, follow-up appointments, early intervention referral, um, a feeding pump. And it was kind of like, <laughs> go to these appointments. And luckily, um, we had we became very close with our NICU nurses. So a lot of them were coming by a lot. Um, so that was a huge help. But um, I can, I still remember like every minute of those 48 days. Um, it's very traumatic. Sure. If I could circle back to just yeah. a couple of things that you said, Megan. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we had a lot of we had a lot of those similar experiences. My daughter did leave the NICU with a feeding tube. Um, but one of the things that you reminded me of when you were talking was the like they would do we would go into the NICU and every day it was like a whole new they were trying new things, they were doing new things, and it always caught us off guard. Like you know, they had to start dialysis. And then one day we go in, the dialysis was working and they're like, we're going to take, we're going to stop dialysis and see what happens. We were like, oh God, you know, like, what do you mean? You're just going to see what happens. And so it was that constant roller coaster of like, things are stabilizing, but now we're going to try something new and what's going to happen next. And, you know, one day we went in and she was on the oscillator. And no one had told us. We didn't know what an oscillator was. And so, you know, just to, again, like hammer down one more time on the trauma and the total loss of control and the unknown that you experience in the NICU. Um, I, I don't know that there's anything else like it in the world. I wanted to um, 
to respond to what you just said about dialysis because they did that um, to us with the ventilator several times um, because she was taking practice breaths, but she was still also actively being cooled. Um, and so the, so that was very traumatizing because she wasn't succeeding when they'd try to extubate her. She'd be okay for like two minutes and then she, it would be an emergency and they'd have to reintubate. Yeah. So what you were saying about dialysis reminded me of that. But let's see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thank you both for sharing about your NICU experience, because I know for a lot of families in our community, you know, getting that diagnosis for many families in our community happens in the NICU. And then families share about also when they are getting to the end of their NICU stay and then transferring home, just the transition there. So if we could talk about next, um, kind of those early couple of years and just the different supports that you had, such as like physical, occupational, speech therapy, the different specialists. And then after, if you'd share just a little bit about kind of how you navigated that mental health struggle of that wait and see journey and, you know, how we talk about so much in our Hope for HIA community about just the wait and see and how it can, you know, just be very difficult and hard for people to kind of understand. So, the night that we brought our daughter home, um, they had given us a choice. They were like, she's ready to leave the NICU, but she's not feeding the, you know, like enough to um, support herself because they were bottle feeding her and she was getting breast milk, but they had all these medications thrown in because she was in like stage three kidney disease when she left the NICU. And so they had like, one of the medicines is literally salt water. So they're putting salt water in the milk and they're like disappointed and surprised that she's not drinking it. And so we were given the option of either having a G-tube inserted and taking her home, or we could transfer her to a long-term care facility for children where they could continue to work on feeding therapy. And we elected the feeding tube. And I know that this has been said by pretty much every single person who's been on any hope for HIE panel, but the feeding tube was the absolute best decision we ever made for that child. And I would make it again a hundred more times. Um, and I would also, well, in our case, when the doctors suggested a feeding tube, we knew that it was the right course of action. Um, and so when we took her home that first night, um, you know, anytime they discharge you from the hospital, <laughs> They start telling you that you're going to leave at like eight o'clock in the morning. And next thing you know, it's 10 30 PM and they're pushing mm -hmm. you out the door in the dark, you know, with this baby who's never been anywhere except in this one room. And so, um, she was in the NICU up in DC and we had to drive back over to Virginia and, oh gosh, she was so overstimulated because, you know, like she had never, she had never experienced a change in the lighting. You know, so like the sounds, the sights, the sensations, like she'd never, this was, they were born in February. So we came out in April and it was still chilly, you know, she'd never been cold, like all of these things. And so we got her back to the house. It was close to midnight. We had another baby at the house who, you know, also wanted me and we had the, um, we went home to home health care. And so we had the new nurse, brand new nurse. We'd never met this person before. And the nurse manager in our living room, screaming baby, screaming baby, nurse, we're trying to do all of this stuff. We've got all these medications that we've never given before. We've never seen before. We're trying to use syringes. And it was just overwhelming does not begin to describe it. And she cried for probably three or four hours before she just gave up and passed out. And, um, you know, from there, we eventually did get settled in. But, you know, like you mentioned, we had all sorts of specialist appointments. We had physical therapy. We had, um, eventually, we ended up with speech therapy for speaking and for e feeding, which was, you know, a different situation. But, um, I mean, we, we went to, I took those babies to doctor's appointments more days of the week than I didn't you know, and every single time we would take her out of the house, she would catch something and then she would be sick. 
um, because, you know, because of her uh, kidney disease that made her immunocompromised and she was just weaker. She had been through so much. And so we were at home unless we were at doctor's appointments. And even then, like I had, I would, we had a double stroller and I would put a blanket over the top, you know, of the stroller so that it would kind of shield them, you know, from people coughing a little bit. I mean, we know, I know how viruses work, but it would at least keep people's slobber off of them and it would keep people's out of their faces, you know? And, um, I mean, I even put a little sign up like with a hand and like a no, because you know how people love to touch babies. People really want to touch twin babies. <laughs> and, you know, it was just like every time she would come in contact with anybody, she would get sick. She would be in the hospital. She would get sicker, you know, and we were doing everything we could at that point to keep her healthy enough to continue to grow, to get big enough to be eligible for a kidney transplant before she had to go on dialysis again. Because when they stopped dialysis, she managed to stay okay. Um, and so, but it was just, it was nonstop. And that was our whole entire lives was around, you know, giving this child medicine, doing tube feeds, talking with the doctors and just completely managing her medical status. That's, uh, and the, the, the wait and see, that's the next question you asked. Um, I'm not exaggerating when I say it was torture. It was, it was a living nightmare, especially those first couple of years. Um, because not knowing is the hardest thing for me. Not knowing is agony because I've, you know, spoken on another one of these before. I like control. I like being in control. I like knowing what to expect. I was like that before I had these kids. Um, but when you know what you're dealing with, you can make a plan. You can take action. You can educate yourself. You can at least try to do things. But, you know, during this time, we were figuring it all out as we went. And, you know, it's the highest possible stakes that any person can imagine. Like, this is your baby. This is your child. And I mean, I guess what I would say to parents who are just going through this for the first time is I see you and it is agonizingly difficult. You're not wrong. It is that awful. I want to um, say to you what you were talking about, um, your daughter being overstimulated um, when they were discharged, when she was discharged. Um, Cause I'm assuming the other twin had already been, been discharged discharged way before um but I remember the the first night because obviously like you said you're normally discharged in the morning we were picking her up at like seven o'clock at night is what ended up happening and she screamed bloody murder in the car because different senses but all it took me like a minute to realize she was afraid of the dark because the NICU is not dark um, yeah. and that was something that, oh, that went on for a long time, probably a year. <laughs> it's, it's, we, she always had like some kind of dim lighting. Um, so I, I, I forgot about that until you said that it's funny how you randomly think about things. Um, I'm just, I'm going to read off a couple of the notes that I had wrote about being discharged and the specialist, and then I'll just go from there. Um, so before she was discharged, obviously, because she had had a G2 put in, we had to be trained on the pump, um, which was interesting to, <laughs> to try to figure out. We had to do an overnight <clears throat> and learn that. Um, she was scheduled with follow-ups with um, GI, neurology, nephrology, um, mm -hmm. pulmonology, because her lungs had kept collapsing after the injury, um, and they were very weak. Um, and obviously, routine pediatrician, orthopedic surgeon, um, early intervention, um, referral. Um, 
And I remember, I think it, it was a couple of days before she was discharged and she had had a neurologist in the NICU, worst bedside manner, really <laughs> egged on the trauma even more, but he, he had told us um, Estella would be lucky to see one years old and to never bring her out of the house because any type of germ could be the end of her potentially. And, and the first year it was like, she did pick up any type of respiratory. We were in the PICU a few times. Um, it was, that was um, crazy. Um, I, the wait and see is horrible um, because you, you, every, they, they tell you, you know, the, the brain can rewire. And so I, I lived off of that since I was in fight or flight all the time, but that, that was something that like kept me going. Cause I, I didn't, I wasn't, there was just so much trauma. And I, so I immediately, when she was discharged, all I did was research. I would spend like all day, all night. Cause I wouldn't sleep cause I was, I was so afraid she was going to stop breathing. Um, but I'd spend all of my time researching like any type of therapy, any, anything that I could do to help her. Um, also we were really lucky in the sense that, that her paternal grandmother who and, and grandfather, but the paternal grandmother, we, we lived with them and she's an OT. So, um, my daughter was, was able to get OT at home <laughs> whenever her grandmother was home. So that was, that was, um, a huge help, but I, I, I look back all the time, even, even sometimes to this day, I, I wish I had been, I feel like I wasn't as emotionally present for my daughter as I could have been because I, I was there. Like you'll see me in pictures. You know, I, I was, I was there. I was there with her all the time. I brought her to her um, appointments, but mentally I was trying to figure out the best ways I could to help her. And I think because of all the trauma, it was just shutting off certain things was the way that I, I had to survive the day to day. Um, and I remember I, I have so many pictures of her from like every day of her life and videos um, because I, I never knew if we would keep having those chances because you don't ever know what to expect. So the first few years, um, and we had a, ended up with a great early intervention team. Um, I loved the doctors. If I, her specialist, there was a few I didn't. So I fired them and I found better <laughs> for her. Um, and yeah, it, the, the wait and see is torture. And the, you can have two kids with the same amount of like loss of oxygen, right? And and one kid might turn out mild and then the other, it, their brain handled it differently and they're more moderate. And it just, there's no rhyme or reason. Um, and it's not fair and I, I still feel like even though she's going to be 11 in a few weeks, I, st I still feel like I still wait and see on things because, but now I'm just not surprised the, the way there were so many surprises in the beginning, because now I feel like we've been through so much. I'm kind of prepared for anything, but things happen along the way. Like she had been stable seizure wise she had only had like a, a a few big ones her first few years but mostly we were stable and then during 2020 um i i'm not sure what sparked it if the, our living arrangements changed i her dad and i separated so she was at his house 50 percent with me i don't know if it was the change in houses if it was stressful but she seized every day like 
sometimes for 40 minutes um, to the point where like I had to give her Versed, paramedics would come have to give her more, we'd end up at the hospital. Like this, this was going on all the time to the point where um, I completely stopped sleeping because her seizures were the kind that happened in the sleep cycle. So you could easily miss it. Um, so I would just watch her um, all night. And that was something I, I couldn't have predicted when I brought her home. We brought her home from the NICU for something like that to happen like seven years later. Um, so, and today she's stable. Everything's great, happy kid. But tomorrow, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And that's kind of how I trained my brain to think. So that way there, there aren't surprises that take my breath away um, like they used to. Yeah. You actually, when you mentioned the neurologist, you reminded me of something. Um, when we were in the NICU right before we came home, I remember somebody giving us, like we got a bunch of paperwork, you know, they give you all this stuff. And one of them was a handout on parenting a dying child. They gave us palliative care pamphlets. And they must have given us at least three copies of this thing because for three years, like until we moved, I kept finding this um, handout. And by that point, I had decided like, okay, she is going to live, <laughs> you know, three years in like, okay, yeah. maybe they were wrong. And um, I just kept shredding them, you know, every time I'd find them and I'd get mad all over again. But yeah, and to your point, there was there was another thing that I wanted to to, to say. Um, I don't remember what it was, but also like we have had more diagnoses come down the pike that you weren't expecting. And um, it's re-traumatizing all over again. You know, it brings all of that right back up. And so you we also live with that uncertainty. That leads us to one of the other topics. Um, we're going to talk about school in just a minute, but since we're already here, I'd love to talk a little bit about just that mental health impact on parents. Um, because, you know, you guys are leaving the NICU knowing your child has some diagnoses that are going to need a lot of intervention. But then also for both of you, things have changed a lot over the years. So it's that constant cycle of changing and new things and, you know, maybe losing a diagnosis or gaining something else or that grief of like, okay, we've done this for a few years with our time. And like, now we don't see this specialist. So if you would just talk a little bit about that, things with like the anxiety, the hypervigilance, mourning your delivery and birth experience, anticipatory grief, really any of that that you'd like to elaborate on would be great. All of the big things. Megan, do you want to go first this time? Um, sure. I was just scrolling through my notes. <laughs> just I wrote down last night some things that I was like, okay, this is important. Well, so the from before um, she, the C-section even happened, but that night when I, I, I was her birthday, when I was watching her have D cells, I, it plays in my mind, um, like very photographic memory. I can, I can recall like exact conversations at exact times. Um, and it's something I just kind of, I, I, I live with that, with the NICU, I think every day of her life since in, in my mind also, obviously very um, complex trauma. Um, but I have like panic disorder. I, I feel like a lot of, a lot of the parents, a lot of us do. Um, I feel a lot of guilt, um, like could this have gone any other way? Um, obviously I, I do wonder what life would be like for her if, if this hadn't happened to her. Um, it's it's something I, I, I go through periods where it is something I still am navigating, I, I feel like, but it's important to find 
support network. I've tried different types of therapies, um, reached out to, to friends. It's, it's just the, it just really is like a lot of complex trauma, um, that when something, another bad thing, like happens like with your child it's like getting re-traumatized all all over again and because of what happened to her I and her father would, would say the exact same thing he says one and done um I myself never wanted another child I wasn't risk gonna risk that happening again um I also didn't think I'd be able to get through a pregnancy without like giving myself a cardiac event um panicking so much if something like that was going to happen again to a second child. So it just really uh, affects everything. And I, I can piggyback off of that. Um, so, you know, speaking of like the mental health of it all and the therapy and stuff, um, we ended up starting therapy when the girls were about a year old and I remember telling my husband on the way home from the NICU one day like when we were going back and forth I said if like if we survive this like whenever this is done we're like I'm gonna have to go to therapy like I am not okay and so it was about a year in I told him again like we have to go because I would just sit in the floor and just sob and just, I told him, like, I wish they had just let us all die instead of making us live this way. Like, why would they save us so that we could suffer like this? Because I almost died. She almost died. The other one was okay. Um, but it was just, I mean, I was a wreck. Like, I did everything that needed to be done. You know, I took care of the girls. I was with them all the time. We breastfed all the time. But to go back to your earlier point, I look at pictures of them when they were babies. And I feel sad that I didn't appreciate how just precious and perfect they were. I couldn't, I couldn't see it. And I worry sometimes now, you know, like 10 years from now, I'm going to look back at pictures of them from when they were 11 and be like, oh, I just couldn't see how wonderful they were in front of my eyes. Um, you know, and part of that, I think it's just being in the trenches of parenthood, but anytime that you're dealing with, you know, like this level of trauma, it complicates things. And we did go to therapy and it helped. Things got better. Um, you know, I, I was able to process some of it and live with some of it, but I just, to me, it felt like I had created this perfect, wonderful thing and the doctors broke it and they broke it and they sent me home to deal with this broken thing. And I had to try and hold it together and make it work. And it's not that there was anything wrong with her. I mean, I, I adore <clears throat> that's not to say that like she wasn't good enough, but like my heart broke for her, you know, that she had to go through all these things that she was in pain, that she was, you know, I mean, even still like, you know, there are things that she, her life doesn't look like everybody else's, you know, and there's a lot of anger and stuff to, to process. And so, um, therapy helped a lot with that. And I've gone back to therapy several times, you know, over the years between now and then for different things. Um, I'm a huge advocate for therapy um, and I also know that it can be incredibly difficult because when we went back, when we went to therapy together, when the girls were little, we took them with us. We found somebody who would see us at like seven o'clock at night and we took the babies with us because that was the only way that we could do it. And so anybody who is struggling, like they're like, I, you know, I can't make this happen. Um, you know, I would encourage you, like, get creative, find somebody, call them and cry and be like, I, like, I need you to please, like, 
you know, let's, let's think outside the box here for this. Um, because that, um, it was a huge help. It was a huge help for us. And, um, it hasn't completely gone away and I don't think it ever will go away, but it's gotten much easier to deal with. And I still wish my daughter didn't have things so hard in this way. Um, but she's okay. And before we talk about anything else, I do want to highlight some different resources that can also be helpful for families. And I also, because I know we're about to talk about school and kind of navigating with a little bit older of a child, you know, late elementary, middle school, those ages. Um, so we do have resources both for parents and for children in this age group and Hope for HIE. For parents, we have so many support groups. We have My Social Work Support. We have Annie's Child Life and Certified Grief Counselor Support. I can link families with resources in their local area. Um, we do provide global support. So please reach out to Hope for HIE. There is more support in our community now than there ever has been. There's so many programs. There are also local organizations, both international and U.S based um, for different groups for in-person and different parenting support where you live and just, you know, doing what you can with the time and the resources that you have and reaching out for that support and asking someone to sort of help you figure out what will help you is a great place to get started. And then definitely looking into our SOAR program. It's a new program that Annie, our child life specialist, is working on connecting children that are 7 to 17 years old with other children in their age group. Um, so that's another way to provide support to your child with HIE, where they can connect with other children that are navigating an HIE journey as well. And I think that that program is going to be so powerful um, as well. So definitely please reach out to myself or Annie if you're interested in those resources. And I think what I'd love to kind of just end on is a couple things. If we could just talk briefly about um, navigating school, so that IEP 504 process, kind of what supports in the school system has helped. Now, both of our panelists are U.S. based, um, but definitely reach out if you have questions and we can sort of help you navigate support with school um, as a Hope for HIE team and connecting you with resources in your area. But if each of you would just talk briefly about what has helped navigating the school process and kind of what you wish you knew when you started with your kids. Um, and then we'll probably finish a little bit after that. Um, so I don't, I, I don't know if it's, I actually know, I think it is if you're in the all of us I, I could be let, let me know if i'm wrong i could be wrong but in in massachusetts once your kid hits three they graduate early intervention and they go into mainstream preschool um at the schools is is that all so US? some version of that yes in every okay. state in the u.s has some sort of their own program and how that looks so for some states it's um, integrated preschools with children and it's different timelines. So like some states it's all day, some states it's a couple of hours, but yes, yep. to some version you age out of early intervention and they do an assessment to determine the next type of support for you and your family. Okay. So, so she graduated um, early intervention um, and we were lucky to her entire early intervention team came to the school that she would be going into to be assessed um, for um, preschool. So they basically modeled for us how an assessment, how an IEP should go. So we were very lucky with that. Um, and the school, so her first year of preschool she was half day and then we just changed it every year after that until she was eventually like full day preschool um but the IEP process has always been fairly I feel smooth um so far <laughs> um there was only one instance I, I can think of when I had to 
fight for something. I think she was probably six. Um, it was something small, but to me, it was it was big. Um, they had wanted to the school um, cut her PT because in her IEP, t- t- she's always had the same. It's she, she has a one to one. She has OT PT um, speech. She has adaptive gym, um, semi inclusive class setting. Things have been altered here and there over the years, but there was one year they wanted to cut her PT in half and I rejected the IEP (laughs) and they ended up putting the PT, the extra PT in there. But other than that, the IEP process so far has been very, very smooth. And I, 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 a lot of that is because we were able to see how it should be done. Also, we were taught to advocate, um, which is, was huge. So we've had a slightly different um, school experience so far. Um, Our girls went to, so, so we had um, early intervention. And then um, when our daughter turned three, actually a little bit before three, she had been released from early intervention. She was okay on PT. Um, We never really did much OT with her as a baby, but we had um, finished uh, speech and like she had caught up on speech and she was able to eat. And so we did like, we did a ton of feeding therapy. Amazing. Um, Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) She actually got her G-tube removed when she was three and she hadn't used it for like six months, closer to a year um and she was like chills that's so amazing yeah yeah we I mean we went we went at it really hard and that's not to say that like she had she had the ability that's not Mm -hmm. to say like not everybody is going to be able to 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 do that and that's okay but she she had the ability and we had the resources um to you know we went to Kennedy Krieger with her and so we had done a ton and so she graduated from her g-tube which was amazing And I think you had mentioned like, you know, one thing. So we went from like, she was swallowing pills at like barely three years old. And then when she was seven, she stopped swallowing pills. And so again, this is this like, you know, yay, we're doing all right. We're doing all right. And then we're not doing okay. So, um, so she aged out of early intervention. She, you know, finished all that stuff. And then she started kindergarten on time um, in the classroom with her sister and she had a 504, but um, she hadn't been diagnosed with ADHD then. We were pretty sure that she had it. Um, but we also, um, like, we didn't know, we didn't know a lot then that we know now. And so we had a lot of concerns in kindergarten, and then we had some concerns in first grade. And I had actually just gone to a 504 meeting and asked them if she needed to be evaluated for learning disabilities. And they were like, no, no, she's still making progress. She doesn't meet the criteria. She's fine. And then COVID started. That was like a week before it was like, you know, or maybe like January and COVID started in February. And um, she was waiting for a kidney transplant. She was supposed to have one just a few months later in the summer. And we were like, all right, we'll see y'all later. We got to go. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so we finished school at home that year. And then we've been homeschooling and we like one way, shape, or form for like three years since then. And so um, we had a great, we had a great experience in public school with the 504s um, or with her 504. Um, The nurse at the elementary school was absolutely wonderful. We are considering possibly putting them back into public school this year. And as part of that, we have gone and had an assessment for um, special education. And so we started that process. So she's been approved for special ed. And I had um, I have a good friend who has retired from teaching and she was a special ed teacher forever um, out of state, but you know, it's, it's all, you know, very similar. There's a lot of overlap. And so she attended by phone for this meeting for us and she, to, as an advocate and that, like you mentioned with, you know, your, early intervention team, it made a huge difference because she was able to discuss things with the special ed committee in terminology that we don't even know, you know, Mm -hmm. 
And um, so that was really helpful. So she was approved. Now we have to coordinate with the middle school to see what would her IEP look like and can y'all give her the supports that she needs? And are we willing to, like, are we going to take this medical risk of putting our kids in school with a thousand other people? Because again, we have like serious immunosuppression and other conditions that we have to consider. Um, so the advocacy never stops, I guess, is you know, the ultimate point to all that is you have to keep going and going and going and you're not always going to be everyone's favorite. And that's hard for me. I don't like sitting in that feeling where you are causing people problems. You're <laughs> making their lives more difficult. You're making them work harder. Um, but it has to be done. And so we do it. So I would love to just end the recording if y'all would each just kind of give a little bit of encouragement on, you know, to any of our families that are newer in their Hope for HA journey or any other families, kind of anything you feel in those first couple of years that you know now that you wish you knew then. I would tell them to breathe, take it day by day, um, appreciate the little miracles. Uh, reach out to whatever your support network is um, and you're just love them. Um, I, I feel like it's just so, so important. Try to be present. <laughs> Don't do what I did. That's, that's all. That's good. Um, I think for me, and I've shared this before and I'll share it again. Um, what I would tell people is that it gets, so I like to liken it to sea glass, like the experience. I like to like use an analogy of sea glass, you know, like when this happens, you're fractured, you're broken and everything is really sharp. All of the edges, all of the pain are really, really sharp. And over time with all of the appointments, the daily life of it all, um, you know, just like the constant wearing away, like you're never that whole, you know, piece of whatever you were when, when this all started, you know, you're never, you're never that again, but those sharp edges are worn down and they just, they don't cut as deeply as they used to. And you're something new and, um, you know, things are not what I had imagined they would be, um, but they're still good. Like they're, they're still good. We still have, we still have like so much normalcy in our lives, like <laughs> so much normalcy of like bickering, like this morning, you know, when I was like, Oh God, I'm completely scattered. And my kids are over here like fighting with their feet, you know, like it's, it's all, it, it's great. It's great. It's not, once you get, <sighs> It's not what I expected. There's a lot of trauma to deal with and carry around, but that doesn't mean that it's all bad. You just have to sift through it. I love that. Very accurate description. Mm -hmm. And I just want to thank you both so much for sharing. I think that this is going to reach so many families and give hope and give just so much information and just all the things that everyone's looking for, especially those first few years that they're reaching out for. I know that this is going to help a lot of families. So on behalf of our whole community, I just want to thank both of you so much for being here today. And please reach out to me. My email is Haley, H-A-L-E-Y, at hopeforhie.org. And I will be happy to connect you with additional resources or if you're interested in any of our other supports and programs. And we'll go ahead and end our recorded session today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.